the law of the purchase redemption of Israelites from captivity. The law of the purchase redemption of Israelites from captivity. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 48, 49, it reads, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Tonight in our Torah lesson, our topic entitled, The Purchase Redemption of Israelites from Babylon American Captivity, involves understanding the meaning of the law of redemption. There's a law of redemption for Israelites from slavery and captivity. Yes. The scriptures even had a prerequisite manner on how to deal with our current captivity in this land of America. Even though chateau slavery is not the case so much now unless you're in prison, but nonetheless, the fact that you are here, not because your ancestors wanted to be here, they were captives here. And while you're still here, you're still a captive you're still part of a captivity. Even though you can come and go as you please, you're still in a land of captivity that had it not been for slavery, you more than likely wouldn't be here right now. So there is a law about you being here and how to deal with this captivity in America. It's, it's the law in Leviticus 25, verse 48, 49, where it says, Unless the person can buy themselves out of slavery, a relative can buy it out of it. Or if, if that person can't afford to come out of the land of captivity, that a relative who can afford to, to help them come out of captivity, can help them come out of the land of their, their forefathers in slavery. That they're, they're, if there's a relative, if there's somebody, that, that can provide the means and the way to bring us back home to the land of our ancestors, to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Yah promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's your land. That is your designated homeland, scripturally, biblically, and by a covenant of salt. It's your land. And yet, there are difficulties in our means to be able to get there. One is to leave this country, you need the funds and the resources. Number two, you need the immigration status and means to come into your own homeland. Your homeland is trodden down by Gentiles right now, as Yahshua said. And they have set themselves up to not allow you to move in to live there in your land right now. And as such, there is a need for somebody who can help us to cross both our financial means as well as our immigration means to get back into the to our homeland, land of Israel. Uh, verse 48 of, of uh, Leviticus 25 says, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. That, that means that Yah said yes for our sins and the sins of our forefathers, we were sold. Yet the scriptures in the law of Moses in, Deuter in Leviticus 25, 48 says that even though we were sold, the potential for us to be recovered and redeemed again can be done by one of our brethren who can redeem us. Verse 49 says, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is near of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. 
In these verses, Yah commands if an Israelite is sold into slavery, a family relative should have opportunity to buy that, that individual out of slavery or provide the means for them to come out of the land of captivity, which would be a payment for the redemption from slavery and captivity for this Israelite. There, there is a very insightful understanding in these verses regarding the purchase redemption for us as a people who are the descendants of Israelite slaves brought to America in captivity in slave ships. And yet, even some of our brothers as the Limba in South Africa and Zimbabwe, they, they will all tell you that their ancestors told them that they did not originate in Sub-Saharan Africa. They will tell you, and it's recorded, that their ancestors came from the North and that they came from the land of Israel. But we migrated down into Sub-Saharan Africa because we were chased from our land and we went into exile because of the sins of our forefathers. And the scriptures give us those accounts. And we now have DNA evidence. I've seen my DNA that actually tracks what the whole place that these brothers in Zimbabwe and uh, South Africa said. They said they came through Yemen. All of a sudden, I looked up my DNA, I saw I had it. DNA relatives through Yemen. Then it said they went down into Sub-Saharan Africa of DNA relatives down there among the Limba. They are most so-called African-Americans, our closest relatives of African tribes are the Limba. I don't understand why, because predominantly the vast majority of us came from West Africa, particularly around Nigeria, that is our ancestors. And I talked with Brother Gakuru, the, the brother from Kenya, that uh, I, I had on with us one night. I said, Brother Gakuru, now you did your DNA. And Brother Gakuru is from a Kikuyu tribe in Kenya and I, I lived and worked among the Kikuyu and the Wakamba and the Baluya people for five years when I lived in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I speak their language and I said, well, when you did your DNA, who did it connect you to? He said, it was the Limba. I said, well, how in the world? I mean, you in Kenya, my ancestors didn't come here to America from Kenya. They came from like the West Coast, but they traveled before they got to the West Coast. Of Africa. And he told me, he said, you know, what happened was that all of us did move to the West Coast of Africa, but some of us moved away from West Africa and went to South Africa and East Africa. That is of the Hebrews. You see, not everybody in Africa is a Hebrew. There's only, the only Hebrew people that are in Africa now are who you call the Bantu people. Bantu is the is the word that means the people. And, and the Bantu people speak an Afro-Asiatic language. And there's different variations and dialects of that Afro-Asiatic language. But it has some Hebrew in it and it has some uh, African dialect mixed in with it. And, and uh, it's definitely uh, a language that got a lot of Hebrew words in it. I'm a Bantu speaker, uh, and I can hear and see a lot of Hebrew words in it. Uh, and whether you're in West Africa or East Africa, there are those in Nigeria and all that had families that moved east. And then some of the families got caught up like our families and were brought in captivity to America. And a lot of people wonder, say, well, how can we say they are a family and they're over there and we're over here? Well, you you got to understand. A family is still family, no matter how they got separated. A family is still a family, no matter how they got separated. Just because, say for instance, I, I'm living in Chicago. My brother lives here with me, and all of a sudden my brother gets captured and sent somewhere like Australia. Just because he's in Australia, and he's having children over there and I'm still having children. That doesn't mean he's not my brother anymore. And so we, we have to start looking at our brothers there as family. Who knows? Some of them got access to resources, minerals, gold, diamonds, oil. They might be people that can use some of that to get us back 
to our homeland of Israel because the Limbers say they, they didn't originate in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Gakuru said that the Kikuyu people, they understood that they didn't originate from Kenya either. They moved there, they lived there, but they said they originated from Israel. And so you see, we may have brothers and sisters over there that can help us in this law of redemption. And some of us are moving and visiting over there and live about property there. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, that's an individual's choice. Just like if I decide I wanna leave Chicago and move to say South Carolina somewhere, that's your choice with spirit lead you, but be sure and be clear that everybody understands that Sub-Saharan Africa was looked upon by our ancestors as a land of exile. It was never looked at as their own. It was always looked upon as their, the land of their exile because they'll tell you that they came from the North. And the land of Israel today is not a land that seems so hospitable to us now because foreigners have occupied. But don't worry about that. The Most High got a plan for them, how he's gonna deal with them. Because this law of redemption, not only is talking about how it gets you out of the land of your exile, whether your land of exile is in America or your land of exile as our brothers in Africa is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Either way, all of these lands of exile, there's a law here in Leviticus that talks about how Yah will bring us out of those lands back to our homeland of Israel, which stretches between Egypt and the Euphrates River uh, in Iraq. Of course, as of now, we're gonna need some help from a kinsman redeemer who's gonna open up the door for us to get there. We're gonna talk about that, that kinsman redeemer in just a moment. So. Uh, the, the scripture tonight in uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 48 through, through 49, it's a very insightful understanding in these uh, verses regarding the purchase redemption for us as a people who are the descendants of African slaves brought to America in captivity and slave ship. Our enslavement in America is described in Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. In the literal, raw transliteration in the Hebrew of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68, it says, Yah shall return you to Egypt. Now, in the context of this verse, Egypt in Deuteronomy 28, 68, in Hebrew, the word Egypt is derived from the root word in Hebrew called sore. In Strong's number 6696, sewer literally means, among other things, to be confined, enclosed, and bound up. That's Strong's number 6696. Uh, this meaning is a clear reference to the return of the captivity of slavery, as was in Egypt. All right, except in this case, the word Egypt is not used in Deuteronomy 2868. The word Egypt is not used as being the literal land of Egypt, but Egypt here is used in a figurative sense to describe the confinement. That's what the, the word Zor, that the word uh, for he, Hebrew word for Egypt comes from, it means a place of confinement and an enclosure. And in Deuteronomy 2868, it's speaking of the confinement and enclosure of Israelites in the hall of slave ships. So this is Egypt in ships. Thus in the Hebrew, the phrase is not, Yahweh will return you again to the land of Egypt in ships. It doesn't say that in the in the actual Hebrew, Deuteronomy 2868. I know King James Version translators have tried to smooth it out to make it sound that way, but that's not what it's saying. But rather in the literal Hebrew, it says, Yahweh will return you Egyptian type slavery in ships. 
That's that's what it literally saying. Yahweh will return you confined and uh, also enclosure, lack of freedom. He will, when it says Egypt, that's what the word Egypt literally means in all of the deep root meanings of the word. That, that this type of enclosure and confinement would be in ships in a way and in a condition, not in a way that speaks of a path that will get you to the literal land of Egypt, the word way. If you read Amos chapter four, verse 10, that word in Hebrew for way is derrick, which means not only a geographical path that you travel on, but it also means a condition or a method or a means of how, how something's done. So in this case, this is not talking in Deuteronomy 28, 68 about the way to the literal land of Egypt, but it's talking about a method a condition which Yah says you will never see again. That meant the condition, circumstances of our enslavement and slave ships being brought to America, Yah saying, you will never see that happen to you again. Hallelujah. Yah saying, you will never see in your future that you will ever be in a slave ship again. And thank goodness for that, because that was a horrendous suffering. That so many of our ancestors went through the pain, the suffering, and, and the tragedy, and the misery. Uh, I, for further reference, I, I believe some of us can read the uh, slave narratives of uh, a guy who took on the slave name, uh, Augustus Vasa. And uh, I can't call his African name, it was an Igbo that wrote a slave ship narrative of what it was like on the slave ship. And it's, it's horrible, and you all know about it. Yah says you all will never, your, your descendants, you and all your descendants, he says you will never see that kind of treatment again. And that's what he meant to, in the way which I said you shall never see again. He's talking about that, the method and the means in which you were in the hall of slave ships. He says you will never see that again. Praise Yah. So, so this, this means uh, something different. Uh, when he says, in the way in which I said you shall never see again, he's talking about the method and the means of your enslavement in the hole of a slave ship. Uh, and, and then he says, from those slave ships, you will be sold to your enemies for male and female slaves. And certainly uh, we know when they brought our forefathers here, they were sold. All right, now the slave ship uh, auction blocks. Uh, we had some of them in Charleston. I think, Emma Vicky, we're somewhat far from you where Charleston is, right? Uh, it's South three Carolina. hours. It's three hours, okay. Um, I don't know, but some of you, if you would like, if you think about it, it's up to you to decide this, whether it would be worth it for us to drive over there and look at the places, because Charleston was a major uh, place where a lot of us were brought into this country. And uh, well, Emma, you think about it, let us know what you think about it. Emma, Vicky, let us know what you think about it. And- uh, I'm okay with it. Oh, okay. Well, let, let's try to make a journey to go there because there's a lot of history there of what we're reading about here in Deuteronomy 28, 68. Now, here's, here's Deuteronomy 28, 68. This is what throws a lot of us off in interpreting it. It says, in one sense it says, there you will be sold for male and female slaves. And like at Charleston, South Carolina, our people arrived and as soon as they got off the boat, they got sold, all right? Or in Savannah, just down the, the coast from there. And I went down there and I saw the slave programs where they, they were sold there. It's something very haunting to go there. I, I know there's an island right there just, just off the coast of Savannah. There's a hotel, and I've had more than one person tell me when they stay in that hotel, they hear things. Now, I don't know what they're hearing, but they hear <laughs> things. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something, maybe it's something psychological going on in their mind, knowing immense tragedy, but I don't know what it is, but they say they hear things. 
at night through that. So I, I, I can only think they're imagining something that's coming to their memory of the sufferings of their forefathers. Same thing at Charleston, which was an even bigger slave uh, sh shipping point. And, and a lot of our people in the South came through Charleston. Whether they went to Alabama or Mississippi, uh, uh, a lot of them came through Charleston. A large number of us came through there and ended up in places like Alabama and Mississippi or even Arkansas. And don't forget about New Orleans. Now, Yah says, there you will be sold. But that is where these slave ships went. But now, what throws us off is the last part of that verse where it says, the last clause, which is translated as, no one shall buy you. As you look at that phrase, no one shall buy you. Now, what does that mean? That in one sense, they tell you, you'll be bought. But in another sense, it says, you won't be bought. Clearly, somebody's not translating. Right, and that's the case. The translation, keep in mind the translators, translators had convenient ways to try to uh, remove things from scriptures that might indict them for what they did to us. Keep in mind now, when the King James Version Bible came out, that was around the time they were just starting to bring us into what we now call the United States of America. And they couldn't just write those translations in a way that would incriminate them. So they made it murky. I can't say it's a contradiction, but it's murky. And you can't make sense of it. One sense it says, there you will be sold. Then another sense said, nobody should buy you. Well, if you're sold, somebody bought you. It didn't say they will try and sell. It says you'll be sold. And then on the other sense, they translate, no man should buy you. Well, there, there's some propaganda why they want to keep that vague and unclear. Not quite a contradiction, but these Hebrew words must be understood in the context they're spoken in. In this context, when it says, and, and no one shall buy you, this is a reference to the law of purchase redemption from slavery by a relative as described in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 48. Again, Deuteron uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 48, when it speaks that no man shall buy you, it's speaking of a relative who could redeem you from the slave auction block. That's the way the culture of ancient Israel was like. It, it was a place to redeem you by a relative, if somebody could come up and pay the fine or the cost of freedom for you, your relative could have first crack at it. But Yah said, when your ancestors landed on the slave coast in Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, Chesapeake Bay, you didn't have any relatives who could buy you out of slave. That's what it meant when it said, and no man shall buy you because this is a reference to somebody who could redeem you, who's a relative based on the law of redemption from slavery that we read here in Leviticus 25, verse 48, which says, after that he is sold, he may re be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. That's, that's Leviticus 25, 48. So that means after, say for instance, you were sold, as you came off a of slave ship, if you had a relative who could buy you on the auction block, they would get first crack at buying you. Then you wouldn't have to go and slave. But as it was, we didn't have any relatives over here when we got here. There was no way nobody could buy us out from being sold on the auction block. And that, that's a prophecy that Yah said. Basically, you won't have a relative that's going to be able to buy you out of this slavery when you landed at Charleston. And, your ancestors landed at Savannah, New Orleans, or Chesapeake Bay, or those slave coasts. There's no relative there that could buy you. And even some people like say, well, I'm Indian. My, well, there was no Indian lined up there on the slave auction blocks in the coast saying, oh, that's my relative, let me buy him. I no Indian chief was up there either. So, uh, you know, so much for that relative. 
if you do have a relative who's a Hindu. Now, it says that in the law of redemption from slavery, Deuteronomy 28, 68 said there will be no, basically when it says no man shall buy you, it's referring to that law in Leviticus 25 verse 48, which says that no man of your relatives, your kinfolk can be there to buy you out. All right. No man of your kinfolk shall buy you out of your captivity in America. And as of today, beloved, I don't know of a relative. I don't have a rich relative that's on the other side of the world. Whether they're in Africa or whether they're in the Middle East, I, I got relatives in the Middle East, in uh, Iraq called the Sidis. These are black Hebrews in Iraq, in Iran. E1B1A, they, they, I match up to them and I, I can track them as relatives. Yet they are all poor. They can barely fend for themselves. Now don't come over to America and say, I'm gonna buy you brother out of Chicago and pay your way for him and Deborah and you to come to, to the land of Israel. They can hardly afford themselves and beside that, the state of Israel don't want them coming into the land of Israel either because our land is trodden under foot of the Gentile right there. You see, and Yahshua said, I got the key of David. I can open, no man can shut. I shut no man open. Right now it seems like he got the door shut for us to come over there. And I keep assuming that's because he's about to do something to those people that he don't want us to be around. Some devastation and judgments getting ready to come on those people over there. They got gay pride parades in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv. Even though they got this, this new prime minister, he calls himself a conservative. He welcomes gay pride parades in Jerusalem, your holy city. I don't want to be around people like that in the Holy Land because I know y'all is getting ready to swat them out there. They're the, work, they, they're the leading pornography center of the Middle East in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is more of a homosexual city than San Francisco is. They, they're blanting, I mean, open up front, walking down the street with each other's hands down each other's pants, men and women. In, in Tel Aviv and all the Arabs around Israel, they, 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 they wonder why we want to go there in a corrupt country like that. I, I don't want to go there in, in that, but I don't at this point even have opportunity because they got the immigration shut. Beside that, some people have done foolishly and taken the conversion as the people down in Demona have done, and then some of them are about to be kicked out of our people. They're not a success story down there. They're, they're a bunch of people having to beg and do a lot of things to survive. And they're living rough. They done better just stay over here. Now their children are growing up without all the moral values and understanding of the scriptures or anything. It's just growing up emulating the what they see young people over here do on YouTube. And so I'm saying the redemption's got to be an all-inclusive process. And it, the redemption from America to our homeland must involve a total package of coverage of all aspects of our life, physically and spiritually, as well as ancestrally. It must all come together. And so verse 48 of Leviticus 25, it says the, repur the purchase redemption of a Hebrew slave by a relative comes after he has been sold. So that meant you and I come from ancestors that were definitely sold into slavery. Why do we know this? Look at our last name. There wasn't nobody in, in Israel with the last name Elmore. Is there anybody, Elder Yahuda, with the last name Carpenter coming out of Israel? Or Ema Sharon? Is anybody with the last name Sutton coming out of Israel? <laughs> Not that I know of. I mean, we all got some names that aren't even our names. Right. We've lost our names. Yeah. Uh, we've lost a lot of things that have to be redeemed and yeah. recovered. And uh, th this is what why this law of redemption is so important because 
in reviewing and studying, it can give us hope for redemption. But we are the children of those that were sold. I remember there was a Hebrew congregation in New York that my elder was a member of, and they used to have a uh, they used to have a regulation. I don't know how how accurate and right it was they had. They said you couldn't be a member of that congregation unless you could show that you are a descendant of a slave in America, which is not too hard to do. <laughs> it's not too. All you gotta do is just start with where your last name is. You can track that kind of easy. I, I remember I went down to South Carolina and I was tracking an ancestor that got off the boat down in South Carolina. And I believe it was a place in South Carolina called Union County. Emma Vick, is that a place in South Carolina called Union County? Or Union City, something like that. Some some small county. And I went to yes, that. Called, yeah, there's a place called Union. Yep. That that's where my my a relative on my 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 grandmother's side that down there in Union he and I always knew he had come from Africa. Mm. And he, was the, he was the first one there, and I I found him there in the library in Union. I went down there in 1984, 94. Yeah, it's a very down. small town. Yeah, very small town. People treated me nice when I tried to find out that history, and I I found him. And I found a slave master who had him there. Slave master's name was Elmore. Is it any coincidence that my last name is Elmore? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, is there any coincidence? You we still on the plantation. <laughs> yeah, we still in captivity. As long as we still under their rule and authority. Right. We still in captivity. So, so when it says no man shall buy you, it doesn't mean that you weren't bought. It just meant that no relative of yours was able to buy you out of that slave. Because we didn't have relatives over here waiting when we got here. Say, oh, that's my relative. Uh, I want to buy him out and take him back. Take him back to Africa. It wasn't, wasn't nobody here like that for you. And we felt like the whole time we here, our, our ancestors were saying that song, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Yeah. So it's a long way from home. And, and you know, now we all knew, they knew they came out of Africa, but if you notice, none of their spirituals talked about places in Africa. They always talked about places over in their homeland, like the Jordan River. They never right. sung a hymn saying, bring me back to the Niger River. Or some of them were able to get out and went back to, to Africa, to Liberia. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was an American colony for those of us who wanted to go back to Africa. And uh, we, we, we know the history of that. Some of us went back there. And then the, those of us in the Caribbean, we realized there was an opportunity the British made. And the British set aside a country called Sierra Leone, where some of us left the Caribbean islands and went there, and those of us that left the U.S. I, uh, U.S. continent, we went to Liberia. So these were mm. two kind of like way stations for us to go back. Now our forefathers here in America, that were conscious because we we always had conscious forefathers. They looked at Liberia, the ones from here. They looked at Liberia as a way station in Africa, and some of them moved there, but they recognized that this was a place of preparation to go back to the homeland of Israel. And in 1967, a number of them gathered in Chicago, including my elder, Daniel Ben Hazel, to the congregation out of Brooklyn. And they, did, they got a group of young people who they said they were going to send to go through Liberia, build a, a community there, and then moved to Israel from Liberia because they felt Liberia was the wilderness of the people. And so we had some of these young people from DC, Chicago, Detroit, and various other places across America that went. And then unfortunately, one of those young people took on an aura unto himself and disconnected himself from the sponsors 
that were based here. And he formed his own community around himself. And they moved to uh, Israel and set up a community in a, a town in southern Israel called Demona, where they are today. Most of that generation has died off though by now. But I knew some of the ones that were there who planned them to go to Africa and to sojourn there as a way station until they got to the land of Israel. Now, the, the fact is, they're, they're there in the land, but they're there in a bad situation. And when judgment comes on that land, it's interesting, the place where they have moved to is the first place that the real enemies of the state of Israel have already said they're going to hit. They also, the real enemies of Israel, like Iran and Hezbollah, they said the first place they will hit if Israel attacks them in their own land. If Israel attacks them, they're going to hit Demona because that's where Israel's nuclear reactor is. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere near there when that time comes, because that's coming. And the fact that the state of Israel wants to challenge and threaten Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, uh, Iran has already served notice that if Israel sets one foot on its land, the first place they're going to hit is the nuclear reactor in Demona. And that's where all of our people are. So they just set themselves up to be in a place where they, it wasn't ready for them to be there yet. They done better just to stay in Liberia than to go there right now in that situation. But you see how sometimes we can jump the gun, but see, y'all got to play. We just got to understand his people. That's the hard part. And we got to be patient uh, because for, for the last three years, uh, leading up to the 400 year prophecy, I was going to Israel every year. Emma Deborah and I. And then all of a sudden, I knew we couldn't stay there because they, they give you a three month visa where you can stay there for three months. And then if you really want to be there another three months, you could get that, but you had to apply for it. They, so all together, you could be there for a whole year, half a year on a tourist visa. After that, you got to go. Okay, so I, I, we knew we could go and visit and we could stay a while. But we didn't plan on being there that long as tourists. I mean, who wants? that's kind of expensive to live that long in, as tourists in the land for six months. Can you imagine how you'd have to financially make ends meet? Money, money burns up fast over there. All right? Mm -mm -mm. So if that wasn't bad enough, after we crossed the 400-year milestone, then the door shut, the quarantine came in. And the quarantine came in. And for the last three years, we were blocked from even being able to visit. Not, not long to stay, but just to visit. All right, because of the quarantine rules. And now we have one sister was able to visit, but she had to go through a lot of red tape to be able to to be there. It wasn't as bad as she thought it was going to be. And Sister Vita Ossie, and she was able to be there, make it for the fall festivals and make it back to Seattle safely. However, we are still planning to go to visit in 2024. And I, I, I personally believe that the, uh, the process in these next two years, uh, Unless things change, uh, I don't believe the quarantine is going to be a factor anymore. But you never know if something else could come up. You never know. So we prayerfully are talking about it. Because I can tell you, when you go to the land of Israel, you'll know that's your homeland. I lived in Africa for five years. And I went to Israel from Africa. And I will tell you, I felt something different. See, the, the issue with Africa, Africa is divided up by tribes. And unless you can track yourself to one of those tribes, uh, uh, even though some of them are now calling themselves Negroes, they're waking up that they're Hebrews, they, there's no land portions based on Negro. There's no land portion there based on Africa. And there's no land portion based there on Black. 
lands are apportioned based on your tribal designation as a Kikuyu, as a Baluya, uh, as a Wajalu. And even when some countries as Ghana are gracious enough to say, oh, we'll make a, side, a, a place for African-Americans to come. Yeah, well, they mean well. But when push comes to shove, times are rough and tough. The politicians that run the country say, well, I have more constituency from the people that are already here than those Negroes from America. And because my livelihood is gonna be based on my constituency, I'm gonna go with my people that are already here. And so you'll see as it happened in the quarantine, some of our people got pushed around over that, put in the back of the line for some things they needed during the time of the quarantine. So you see, they don't have it. They idealistically will say this, 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 you're welcome. I've been through this process. I know what I'm talking about. But when it comes time to food shortages and plagues, and everybody reverts back to the tribalism. I'm a Kikuyu. Uh, I'm a this. I'm a Zulu. I'm a I'm a Igbo. And unless you can show you are descending from one of those people's families, I mean literally, that, that you want to you won't be able to have much influence. But oh, when I left there and I went to the land of Israel, I knew and I didn't understand it. I know there were foreigners treading on my land. I knew it. But at the same time, I could feel the bones of my ancestors buried there. I did the DNA to their bones of my ancestors. I had first got DNA through my ancestry and 23 and me. And all they do is compare your DNA to, to modern populations. But see, populations have moved a lot in the last thousand, two thousand years. A lot of people that are in Africa now weren't originally there. They were over in Israel. But if you compare the DNA with the modern population of people in Israel today, it'll look like you don't have any roots there. So what we had to do we had to do uh, our DNA in comparison, not to the people on top of the ground in Israel, but we had to match our DNA with those who are buried under the ground in Israel. Whole different story. Matches came up. And the people on top of the ground over there don't have no matches to those people, to your true. They don't have matches to the people of the skeletons and bones found in Lekish the town in Judah, that your physiognomy, with your dalecosophallic skulls that you have as Israelites here in America, is the same skull formations they have there. So you see, there's, a, there's some issues. Shalom, Dr. Davis. There are some, some issues of inheritance you got there that can be tracked to your homeland through the bones of your ancestors. That's how I was able to track Tel Yahu in the region of a town near Lachish in, in Judah. I found a match of my ancestors. I found them through their bones that were buried and excavated. You see, so the Valley of the Dry Bones comes to mind that Yah reconnects us to our heritage and roots to the land of Israel. And then those people on top of the ground in the land of Israel, they don't have any connections to the people whose bones are underneath the ground of Israel. I, I never forget talking to a lady at uh, the Jewish uh, Ancestry Genealogical Society here in Illinois. And she admitted to me that, that, that their ancestors don't have any roots to the ancient DNA of ancient Israel, they don't have it, but you got it. Our women got the female DNA, L2, L3, that's there, the men. We, are, we all predominantly have the, the E1, B1A DNA of those buried there, they dig up the fossils. And then the Israeli government have nerve enough to sit on the death, 
that they dig up like at Lake Keith. They sat on the data of the DNA sequence, but they couldn't sit on the data uh, of the anatomical uh, skeleton remains, which fit your, the men's dolichocephalic skulls. Those people that are there today have skulls that are Japhetic, Indo-European people that's round, not, not long and broad like your heads are. We got some heads on us, that's for sure. And, <laughs> and their women didn't have L2, L3 mitochondrial DNA. Their mothers are mostly European women converts that go back less than a thousand years ago, all from Europe. And yet they use that as the standard for determining who a Jew is. And yet the, the women they use for that standard that converted to Judaism, those women were themselves converts. So you see, we have to remember what scripture said. Uh, we have to remember where this is headed. Now, some of our people among Igbo are moving back to the land. Some of our brothers of the Limba are moving back to the land. Some of our people from Ethiopia, Beta Israel, have already moved back to the land. And even some of our people from here in America and move back to the land. No. Yet they all had to come under the dominion of other people's rule in our land. So they're still captives. Because until you rule your own land, your land a captivity, and they don't rule their own land. There's not going to be any prime minister of Israel who's an Ethiopian. There's not going to be any prime minister of Israel who's Igbo. There's no prime minister of Israel that's going to be a limbo. It's always going to be an Ashkenazi that's going to be the prime minister of Israel. If they, if these are European Jews. They're, they're never going to let those of us be that. So we're under their dominion and captivity, even in our own land. Even in the time that Yeshua came, the people living in the land, they cried out in the book of Nehemiah. They said, we live as slaves on our own land. That's in the book. You read their, their prayer in the book of Nehemiah. They prayed and said, we live as slaves on our own land because at the time they were under the dominion of the Persian Empire. So they were there, but they weren't in control of their own land. That's the way our people are of color over there now. So you see, whether you're over in this captivity here or whether you're in the land of exile in Africa or whether you're in the captivity still in your own land, until you have freedom and redemption to buy in your own land, live where your ancestors lived, you're still in captive. We're still a captive people. We have to understand. So therefore, Leviticus chapter uh, 25 is talking about the redemption from a, of a relative. After you've been sold out, and bought out. We think about Kyrie Irving this week. A bunch of Hebrew Negroes in the NBA that are billionaires, like LeBron James, a billionaire. This Negro got to still think and act like a slave mind to throw his brother under the bus. I love LeBron, but don't, but he sold out. Stephen A. Shaq. Bark. Shannon Sharp, and there's a host of other ones. Sellouts, sellouts, sold out. They're still slaves in their mind and in their heart. How are you gonna be a slave and you're a billionaire? It would seem like you got enough money where you, you can speak not as a slave anymore, but LeBron don't know that. Michael Jordan don't know that. Oprah Winfrey doesn't know that. Well, we're going to look at something here in a minute. Let me wrap this up. I want y'all to look at it. I have a video to show you. It's only 10 minutes long. So in Deuteronomy uh, 28, 68, it's definitely referring to Israelites who were sold into American slave mass markets during the transatlantic slave trade. But they had no relatives, as described in Leviticus 25, 48, 
49, who could provide the purchased redemption price, they could buy them out of American slavery. This is what is meant by the phrase in Deuteronomy 20, 68, 28 and 68, no man shall buy you. So in the law of the purchase redemption from slavery in Leviticus 25, when there is no one of the relatives who can purchase their enslaved relatives out of slavery, as stated in Deuteronomy 28, 68, then it states in Leviticus 25, 53 through 54, that is, if you didn't have a relative, and when you got off, your ancestors got off that slave ship in Charleston or that slave ship in Chesapeake Bay or Savannah or New Orleans, and, and you, your relatives could not, you didn't have a relative here in those slave shipping ports in Mobile, Alabama where the supposed last slave ship came. There's a place in Mobile, some of us have been there. I don't know, anybody been to that place in Mobile? Have, who, who, so, you been there? Oh, okay. Who's that speaking? There. Who's that speaking? Based on what we have so far, you go over the government rate. There's um there's one in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, a museum that's really nice. Oh, now you're talking about Montgomery. Yeah, Montgomery. and they have a, a memorial also. Uh, the memorial has um a lot of steel uh, beams, and it has uh every everybody name listed that was lynched. Oh my! See, we 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 realize and recognize. As we, I hear somebody got something in the background. I thought there was somebody talking in the background. I heard, heard. okay. All right, hold on just a minute. Let me clear this up just a moment. Somebody, uh, okay. Somebody got something playing in the background? Somebody have something playing in the background? All right. Then. I I hear something in the background. If you could mute your mic, I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, yeah, uh, there's no record. Uh, of anybody out in those places that could buy us out of the captivity. And so Leviticus chapter 25 has a instruction that would apply to you and me. Now this is instruction for you and me now that we have to look at because our forefathers and foremothers were sold. And nobody was here when they got off those slave ships to buy them out of that slave. And we have since been here. So it says in, in Deuteronomy 25, verse 54 and 55 for people like us. It says, and if he be not redeemed, that is redeemed from slavery. If he be not redeemed in those years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me, the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am Yah, your Elohim. You see, uh, Elmore may own me in Elmore County right down there by Montgomery, Alabama. That's where we get the name Elmore. There's a county name. Elmore County. What name? Because of my great grandfather, because I don't have a paternal European ancestor, but on the maternal, there yeah, pops up some European on the maternal side. But not on my, my, my father's lineage side. I don't have no, no paternal European man on that side. But on, on the female side, they couldn't help him. They were victims and they were imposed upon. 
Yeah, I knew we were gonna go through all this. You know, isn't it amazing that after all those centuries that we went through this, verse 55, Leviticus 25 said, verse 54 and 25 says, there's a time when y'all will redeem us out of this captivity. We've already shown captivity is not just when you're not in your homeland, it's when you're not in your homeland in control of your homeland. Because we already know from reading in the book of Nehemiah, they were praying a prayer. They were in the homeland of Israel, but they, they said, we're, we're like slaves in our homeland because the Persians at the time were controlled. Then after the Persians, the Greeks came and controlled our land. Then after Greeks, the Romans came. And the Romans were in control of our land when I sure was there. So our people were still living under captivity. In fact, even the people that wanted to kill Yahshua, they couldn't kill him themselves until they had to go to the white man called Pilate and beg his permission to kill Yah's only begotten son among us. That's, 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 that's a sold out slave minded Negro that would do things like that. that. That's slavery in your own land. You could see examples, Caiaphas. The Sanhedrin, they were all slaves in their own land. And so they sung a song, they, well, they wrote a statement in the book of, in the book of uh, Nehemiah chapter nine. And it says in a latter part, uh, it says verse, um, Verse 20, verse, verse, actually verse 30, 36, 37. Behold, these are some of your ancestors. By the way, some of your ancestors are listed there with the name Sena. In every place our ancestors went they came through Yemen, through East Africa, and down into South Africa. But every settlement he set up, they would call it Senna. Senna's lit, his name is listed here in the book of Nehemiah. There's a genealogy record here in this book. But they, they said the whole time they lived in that land, when it was under the authority of these Gentile rulers, they said, verse 36, behold, we are servants. We are slaves this day. And for the land that thou gave us as our fathers eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants, are slaves in it. We're slaves in our own homeland. That's what they were saying. Because see, for them, the captivity not only meant that you were away from your land, but your land was under the administration of other people. See, right now our land is under the administration of other people. And if we move there now, we're still in captivity because those other people are running. He says, he says um, verse 37, yield as much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle and at their pleasure. We are in great distress. This is Nehemiah. Chapter 9, verse 37. And yet, in the genealogy record of Ezra, during that time, in verse 35, the names of collective people of, of the family of Sena. In verse 37, the, the children of Sena, 3,630. These, these are the people that are related to you today called Limba. But, but see, when we come here to, to, to Leviticus 25, verse 54 and 55, Yah says, even though these other foreigners, these foreigners have been over you all this time, you're still my servants. And so Yah says, I have a plan of redemption for you. Since there was nobody 
When y'all got off the slave ship, there was nobody here to buy you out of slavery. Eventually, I'm going to have to take you out of this captivity. You are not to, he's basically serving notice to this culture, this society that's made people like Stephen A., Shaq, Cuomo, billionaires, uh, or, or people like LeBron. They're billionaires, but they live and think like slaves, willing to let another young man get, get beat up, and stipulated with all of these emasculating terms before he can come back to work. Well, yes, yeah, says he has a plan for us coming out of this captivity. All of these things just to remind us, we're not free here. We're not free till the only boss over us is Yah and no other man between Yah and us. Right now, wherever we go in there, there's always gonna be some other man between us and Yah. All right, so that in this case, we Israelites, Yah said, you didn't qualify to have been redeemed by somebody when you got off the slave ship and nobody was waiting there to buy you out. No man will buy you because you were sold. But if you had a, had a relative that was there, right there on the, the ports there in Charleston and Savannah and in, in Mobile and New Orleans and Chesapeake Bay, all those areas around Baltimore and so forth, Virginia. There's nobody to buy you out of that. But y'all said, behold, I got another plan for you. If you be not redeemed in those years, you still living in captivity. He says, but th there's a year called Jubilee that's coming where both you and your children will come out of the captivity. For you, children of Israel, you my servants. You are my servants. You're not this man's servant. I've got you on loan under him because you did not acknowledge me as your sovereign. You turned to other gods. So I lift you to the gods of the Gentiles. And not only that, because you submitted to our gods. I made it where you had to be submitted to them. And that's the story. We've adapted their religions. Wherever we go, gods of wood and stone, Christmas trees, wooden crosses, the cobblestone in Mecca. We will always worship the gods of the people that enslaved us. The Easter bunny. Fertility goddess worship called Easter rather than Passover. We 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 now all up and trying to get ready for Christmas. Christmas trees are already coming up. Gods of wood. Because that Christmas tree represents a god of wood. It's based around a god of, of, of the evergreen tree. There's more to it than that. Don't have time to explain that. In spring, the Easter Bunny or Ramadan come. We praying towards Mecca, fasting. Yeah, these were the people that caught us and put us on slavery. Why are we, re why are we going with his religion? And then the people that bought us, we're going with his religion. Why, why is it? Y'all say, you my servants. He said, if you his servants, that means you 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 are obligated to serve him with the feast that he gives you, like Passover, instead of Christmas, or or instead of Easter, or Sukkot, instead of uh, Christmas, and or or Passover instead of Easter, Saturday Sabbath instead of Sun God Day Sabbath, or Sunday Sabbath. In other words, you can tell we still. We think like slaves, we worship like slaves, and we economically act like slaves, as you can see what they're doing to Kyrie. All them bought out and sold out Negroes on TV, a number of boys, just straight up boys. But, but you're going to see there's a backlash. Things are changing. But y'all said, I got a plan for you. His plan is 
since nobody bought you out of slave, out of captive, nobody paid for your land to be restored back to you where you owned your land. See, the, originally the Jewish people, they didn't even plan on taking the land that belonged to you. They were gonna buy Uganda originally, the Zionists. They had plans to buy Uganda and make a Israel and Uganda. That was their original plan. But then the devil led them to go ahead and take what belonged to you. And they're not the servants of Yah. They're not the servants. He said, you my servants, but you in captivity and you serve other deity. So we're not serving the one that we should be serving. But he said, nonetheless, since there was nobody to buy you out of this condition, I have a time. It's called the year of Jubilee. Now everybody keeps saying such and such a year is the year of Jubilee. I remember people were saying that in 2019, that, that was a year of Jubilee. And I remember there's historical records to show in 1865, when, when our ancestors came out, shadow slave, Juneteenth Day, they said that that was a Jubilee. <laughs> jubilee year they made up. But see, y'all got his own calendar. And it appears, my brothers and sisters, tonight, none of us know when the jubilee year is. Only Yah knows when it is. Because you see, because of exile, we lost an understanding of that count. And sure, we can say every Juneteenth, I remember I read the records of, of preachers in the year 1915. Uh, a lot of our churches in 1915 we're proclaiming 1950 as a Jubilee year. Uh, and I seen the sermon. I read a, a famous pastor's sermon saying, this is our Jubilee year. Well, yeah, figuratively. But 20, uh, 1950 came and went, and you're still living under the authority of another man. So 1965 came, Dr. King. Got a lot of laws changed. LBJ signed laws in places where I used to couldn't go as a kid. Now all of a sudden I could go to it. People say, well, that was a jubilee year, 18 or 1965. That's civil rights. But we still are not free. We still under this man's authority, economically and politically. If you don't think so, <laughs> Look at people that are billionaires like them. They're still scared. They're jumping all over Kyrie. All right. Look at them. They're scared. They're willing to throw each other under the bus. This is straight up crab in the barrel minded Negroes. Slave minded Negroes. All right. Then 2015 came. A lot of people say, oh, something's going to happen. I don't recollect much at hardly. Anything came in 2015. Then something said, no, it's really 2019 at the end of 400 years. Well, uh, I know judgment began according to the prophecy in, De in Genesis chapter 15 and verse, and verse uh, uh, 14. After the 400 years, judgment will come. Yep, quarantine came, things shut down. And ever since then, the world has been in one Tremendous crisis after another. Even uh, that happened, but still, I'm still under this man's authority. I'm still under his authority. Even if I go to Africa, those people are not free. The governments there are all dependent on American foreign aid. They're not free. They can't make it without. And that's why so many of them are trying to flee and go to other cities. In places they try to come over here. The United Arab Emirates said that people from Africa can't come over there. But why why they why they want to leave there? You go live up under the Arab. The Arabs said we don't want y'all over here. They they the Arab the United Arab Emirates just put up a restriction on about 20 or 22 African countries. But they can't come, they can't get a visa. Not even to visit, not alone to stay. 
but to visit. They can't get a visa. In essence, we struggle. But Yah said, I got a plan for you. And don't lose heart. Don't get discouraged. He said, there's a jubilee year. And, and, and I've come to see, none of us know when that jubilee year is. He said, that jubilee year comes. That's when your redemption comes. And the, and, the, and the thing about it is, don't listen to anybody tell you that they know when the jubilee year is. They don't know. They don't know. How many people you heard say they know? And then it comes by and we're still in the same condition. He said, but in the Jubilee, both you and your children will be free. So I, I want us to look at this Jubilee here. Uh, verse, uh, the Jubilee year. Now, he, now he's saying that you, Israel, as a nation, come out. Now, I know some of us may come out and move individually to places and locations. That's fine, you know, whether it's in America, whether it's in Africa, wherever you can move. The best situation is suited for you for what Yah is leading you to do. This is in no means judging that. But what we're saying is the final answer comes in the year of Jubilee, which none of us know. None of us know that year. And ultimately, Yah is dealing with us collectively as a nation. When he put us on them slave ships and brought us here, he didn't deal with us as individuals. He dealt with us collectively. Why? Well, even as though it seemed random, particularly with the men, that we just would be caught up from different occasions in Africa. And yet, when the DNA evidence came in, the vast majority of us came in from one family DNA, E1B1A. And yet there's multiple, there's different DNA haplogroups, male haplogroups in Africa. Why didn't, why weren't so many of them there? We had maybe a few of those, but over 85% of the men, they came with the, the haplogroup E1B1A. That's uh, the, the great geneticist named Dr. L. Hop. He says E1B1 is the parental ancestry of the ancient Israelites. I mean, the scientists have called this out. So when Yah put us on them slave ships from Africa, he had us come as a unit. It, as random as slavery seemed, the vast majority of us came from the same bloodline. Some of us came, you know, a very few smidgen of us had some of the mother bloodlines from sub-Saharan Africa, but, but, but we, we, we connect. It's like one unit. That's amazing right there. That, that was discovered. Then our women. Uh, all of our women, even more so than the men, all of our women were happy to do that, which is the ancient Israelite female DNA. They uncovered that at Tel Halula in Syria, back to the days when Jacob went over there in Haran, 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 which is in Syria, in the northern Mesopotamia, where he got four wives. Rachel, Leah, Zilpha, and Bilhah. All of them were El Hapa group women. All of our women in this captivity are El Hapa group women. There were other Hapa group, uh, female Hapa groups in Africa. Why, why is it all of our women are El Hapa group? Because Yah sent us as a nation. We didn't realize it because we were separated. But he sent us over as a nation. And guess what? When, he, when the year Jubilee comes, he brings us out as a nation. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so according to, to verse 54 of uh, Leviticus 25, forgive me, I'm running over a little bit. He said, because no man bought us collectively from slavery and captivity. We then ought to come out of America collectively as a group in a Jubilee year. The Jubilee year comes every 50 years. It states in Leviticus 25, verse 8 through 13, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Shabbats of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall hollow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty 
throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man into his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not plant, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, shall return every man unto his possession. See, y'all got a year marked out that none of us know. It's called the year of his redeeming. That's what it's called in Isaiah 63, verse 4. The year of my redeeming has come. Only I knows that year. So far, every one of us tried to figure it out. We've been wrong. Now, the Jubel, translated as Jubilee, the Jubel, which means in Hebrews 31, in, the, in uh, the Hebrew Concordance 3104, it means to make a blowing sound through a horn of a male lamb called a ram every 50 years. It was to signal the commemoration year of liberty or freedom of Hebrew slaves. Also to commemorate that they had confiscated land and property that they lost to other occupants through the debts. In this case, it was our debts unto Yah. All of this returns back to them in the Ubel year or the Jubilee year. The blowing of the ram's horn on Yom Kippur spiritually represents that Israelites send debts unto Yah for breaking his laws and his commandments are forgiven. Now, the Jubilee year. Yeshua spoke about the Jubilee year. Yeshua said in Luke 21, verse 24, regarding the consequences of Israel's sin, that it would take them into captivity and slavery away from their own land, which would be trodden down and occupied by Gentile foreigners until he said those Gentiles' time is fulfilled. Where well, he said in verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The fulfilling or completion of Gentile time to occupy our land of Israel while we are away in this land of slavery and captivity is what Yahshua is referring to with the phrase, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down in the Gentiles until. The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The uh, com fulfillment and completion of the time of the end of European Gentile occupation of our land by the congregation of Satan, who say they are Yahudim and are not, but do lie. This will come to an end with the blowing of the shofar of Yah in the year of Jubilee, which will also be the year of liberty for Israelites. When we leave the lands of Gentile exile and slavery, that we have endured and returned to our homeland of Israel. The Hebrew word for liberty in Leviticus 25, verse 10, it, it speaks of the year of liberty in reference to the phrase year of liberty in, in Leviticus 25, 10. That, that is the Hebrew word daror, which in Strong's number 1865, strangely was the number of the year we were liberated from shadow slavery in America in 1865. In Strong's Concordance, the definition for the word liberty is number 1865. That's quite a coincidence. I don't know what that means. But we know that the year 1865 was not the Jubilee year because we did not see our return to Jerusalem, which Frederick Douglass declared was our homeland in his 1850 4th of July speech in Rochester, New York. But Isaiah, the prophet, declared the year of liberty, the Daroy year, he declared about the Jubilee year that's referred to in Leviticus 25, 10, of which it said in, in Leviticus 25, 10, and you shall hollow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you, and you shall return unto his possession, and you shall turn every man unto his family. But but Isaiah 61. Verse one describes a proclaimer of the true jubilee. That is, the, the true year of liberty, none of us know, but there's somebody that knows that will declare it and proclaim liberty throughout all the land. The year that is called 
the Darur or the liberty year. When Israelites leave, Isaiah uh, declared of this proclaiming of the Jubilee, that this proclaimer would announce a message that is declared in Isaiah 61 verse 2, where the proclaimer of the Jubilee would announce, the spirit of Yah Elohim is upon me, because Yah have anointed me to preach good news unto the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives or slaves, and the opening of the prison where other captives and slaves are, the opening of prisons to them that are bound and to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah. Notice in, in verse one of Isaiah 61, the proclaimer who knows the year of Jubilee, he is to proclaim the year of the roar or liberty for the redemption of the captivity of Israelites, even for the Israelites in the captivity of prison. It was declared to them the Jubilee year described in Leviticus 25.10. Also in verse 2 of Isaiah 61, the proclaimer, in Isaiah 61, verse 2, the proclaimer of the coming great jubilee liberty also declares the year of Razon, which is Hebrew 7522, which means the year of Yah's favor and goodwill towards Israel when he reverses the curses on us and puts them on our enemies, of which the proclaimer also declares the day of vengeance of our Elohim on our enemies. Yahshua taught in Leviticus 21, verse 24 through 25, regarding the time of the end of the fulfillment of Gentile world power leading up to the Jubilee year of redemption for Israel. He said in that time leading up to the year of redemption that great signs in the sky would happen and great catastrophic events would occur on the earth leading up to the proclamation of the year of Jubilee. And he says that Jerusalem the time of it being tried down by the Gentiles would be close to ending. Because he said there would be signs in the sun in verse 25 of, uh, of Luke 21. He says there would be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress the nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring, verse 26, Luke 21. Men's hearts failing them for fear. For looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. This morning, Tuesday, November the 8th, 2022, there was supposed to appear the sign of a blood moon on, on, on this date uh, of November the 8th, which was the midterm election date for the United States of America. I don't know what that means because a blood moon is a foreboding warning sign. And this has never happened before that there's a blood moon and an eclipse in the sun and the moon which takes place on a major election day in America. This, this has never happened before. Something happened today. Many of us were asleep, I know I was, but around four o'clock this morning, there was a blood moon that appeared, or was supposed to appear, which was an old, on this, cult, this society. Right now, people are on TV looking at who won these elections, who's gonna win the House and the Senate, right now as we talk. Is there a sign from this? We, this bear is watching. Could this be a sign in the heavens? He said, in the time leading up to the year of redemption, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars in Luke 21 and 25. He said, so we wonder, could this blood moon be a sign in the heavens of the coming in of the Gentiles? Because a blood moon involves a sign from both the sun and the moon. So that's a sign right there. But is that the sign of the coming of the year of redemption? We'll have to wait and see. Only he knows. And, and the beginning, is this the time of the beginning of the rise of power of the children of Israel in the time of Jubilee spoken of in Leviticus 25, 10? Something happened today. I don't know what it means, but it's some sort of foreboding warning to America that the time of its economic power of, over us is coming to an end. I know that much, but I don't know how long it'll be before we come out of this. But it, this bears watching, I sure said in Luke 21, 25, that at the time of the Gentile age, that there would be signs in the sun and moon and stars. So there was a sign in the sun and the moon this morning on this important election day. First time that had ever happened in the history of America. This election day blood moon is a sign in the sun and moon happening at this pivotal day of 
Gentile world governance and politics with this election. You know, everybody in the world is watching what's happening with this election today. I look at all the news services around the world. They're all being affected by what goes on in America. Every nation on this planet is affected by how this election is turned out in America. They, you know, they're, this is the only country in the world that's like that. They're watching. The whole world's watching. And then, yeah, y'all allowed in his nature for there to be a blood moon this morning. I don't know what it means. It bears watching. In Luke 4, 16 through 21, Yahshua declared that he is the great proclaimer and fulfiller of the jubilee redemption of Israelites, declared in Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 2, and Leviticus 25, 10. It says in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the day of the Shabbat day and stood up for to read. And there was given unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. The spirit of Yah is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the afflicted. He have sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year, the year of favor of Yah. And he closed the book, and he gave it unto the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ear. That is in that day when he read that, he did not fulfill the Jubilee year. But he said he was then recognized to be the one who is the proclaimer that is to come, who will fulfill the Jubilee year. That day he served notice to Israel that I'm the one that will be the one who will announce to you the year of the Jubilee that we are still waiting for. The prophecy that he said he fulfilled that day was that he would be identified as the one who would be that great proclaimer. But he says this in Luke 21, verse 24 through 28, he taught that there would be certain events leading up to the Jubilee redemption. Like we read in verse 24, that Jerusalem will be tried by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Also, we read in verse 25 of Luke 21 that there will be signs in the moon and the sun, like we saw this morning with the blood moon on this pivotal election day that all the world is watching right now. This election, all the nations are watching, may affect how budgeting will be for the war in Ukraine. Russia's watching, China's watching whether there will be a government that will be set up that will be friendlier to them economically. There's a lot of things in the engine and the balance of the world order right now, this moment, and there was a blood moon. So there will be signs, he said in verse 25, in the sun, the moon, and the stars. But he also said there will be distress of nations. Some nations don't get enough food, like in Africa. They depend on the food supply from Ukraine and Russia, but they're fighting. So these countries like some of them in Africa, they're not getting enough food supply. I used to wonder, I asked the brother in Ukraine, in Uganda, I said, man, y'all got one of the most beautiful lands. So why is it you have to beg for food? Because I used to deliver food. I used to live truckloads of food to places in Africa. And they were beautiful, beautiful vegetation, flowers. And I remember this, 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 this African elder from Uganda, he told me, he said, Nikwasa Babu ya. Damu, the Kwasababu Yadamu, which was he saying, we've spilled much blood over this land. We've killed up a lot of people. We've tried to genocide each other over tribalism reasons. And that blood has cursed our land where we can plant. The land looks beautiful, but the land won't produce for us. The curse of Cain is on this land because we've shed innocent blood in Biafra, where the Igbo live. We've shed innocent blood in Congo, 
with civil wars. We shed innocent blood by Idi Amin in Uganda. We've shed innocent blood. We've murdered one another through tribalism all over this country. It won't grow for us. It looks beautiful, it sounds beautiful, but it still don't produce enough food to feed us. We have to depend on food from Ukraine and Russia to feed our country. We don't get enough rain. I said, Elder, why is that? Because of Bobby Adam. The Swahili Bantu word Damu is a word in Hebrew also Dam as well. It's a, it's a Hebrew word. He's in that Kwasa Babu. Yadamu. Yadamu. This land is not. I said, but you got a beautiful land. It's the curse of Cain. Cain killed his brother, and the land wouldn't grow for him. That's what's happened on Africa right now. Africa's been killing each other. Up. Africa is unstable. I've worked with the Africa Peace Center. Dr. Ephraim Isaac set up, who's in my documentary. His hope was that they could teach Africans who come over to America. Most of them were leaders of those countries who trained in America. And they learned the political greed of American politics and bring it over there. And the system of elders in the communities that could deal with conflicts between tribes from an indigenous leadership way. They don't know that anymore. They have to be retaught. They live just like the American politicians over here because they go to the schools over here and they bring back those principles over there. And now innocent blood has been shed and y'all just won't bless Africa. It's not gonna grow enough. And yet it's a beautiful land. It's a beautiful place, but it don't grow enough. Either gets too much rain or against too little rain. That's why I was over there, trying to help them get food where they could grow seeds, like in Kenya. They had drought. Beautiful country, good for grazing cattle, rich savanna lands. Babu Yadamu, it won't grow. Why? The Kikuyu are fighting the Maasai. The Maasai are fighting the Kikuyu. The Kikuyu are fighting the Wajalu. The Wajalu are fighting the Kikuyu. The politicians run to get office. They kill each other off for the measly little few bucks they can squeeze like bleeding blood from a turnip from these countries that don't have an industrial complex. Yet they sit on the greatest, richest minerals of the world. But as Dr. Ephraim Isaac said, you can't have investment when there's no peace, when people sitting in their churches get blown up and shot up, I know what that's like. Working in areas where Somalis will come down and kill elephants, the shell of tusk of the elephant, the tusk of the elephant. One tusk could be about $2,000. To them, that's a gold mine. Because most of them in a whole year can make only about $500. That one tusk, that's about three or four years of annual salary. So they start killing up the elephants, that tusk, and they'll kill you up. Just so happened, I would pray before I travel. And I went all over the, the place, but I never announced where I was going. And I had to go through rough stuff. I had, I had to pay off at Scar, I had to pay off policemen. They weren't making it up. They might find ways to find traffic fines. I had to pay them a little of what they call child. I had to deal with that. I've been locked up over there for having preached at night. They got night curfews because all of the politicians are scared if you have a night meeting, you may be scheming against the government to bring them down. I've had the government call me up in Kenya and say, stay in your house. Somebody reported in the CID that you are working as a spy for the South African government. I said, who did that? And then I found there was some chief when I was giving out the seed, I wouldn't give him any because he was selling the seeds to his own people. And so he had connections. And I had to call the U.S. Embassy. See, I said, they got me and my family. Well, we're, we can't leave our house. And the U.S. Embassy had to call the, the Kenyan government. 
for my behalf. See, I'm telling you, I know these things. I'm telling you, Africa is not going to be a paradise. It may be better than over here. This ain't no paradise either. But I'm here to say it's not going to be the answer until you know what the answer is, the year Jubilee. Until the year Jubilee comes, wherever we go, whether it's Africa or whether I stay, I want to get out of Chicago. Chicago's worse than anywhere I know in Africa right now. At least they don't have guns over there. It's hard for them to use guns. It's hard to get a gun in Africa. They can sure bang you up with those machetes. And they can bust in your house. And look at what you got. They can follow you. They're desperate. But they don't have guns. So if you keep smart, you can watch out for them. Or you're going to get your head banged in. They're going to be disfigured. Because they don't have guns. So they just bang you upside the head with a machete. I've seen friends banged up pretty bad like that. I'm here to say today, we have to wait on the year of Jubilee. That's, that's what's going to be our saving grace from captivity anywhere in the world. And Yahshua says there will be captivity. That verse 26 of Luke 21, he says, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking on those things to come on there. You know, I'm afraid to go to a place in, on the south side. They have some of the best vegan food. But I go there, I get carjacked. And it's about a lot of young people that used to be my kids when they were locked up. I can't, I can't trust people. It's, a, it's around, it's coming near a neighborhood that you live in. So I'm not saying where you should go, or where you should be, whether here or Africa, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying until this Jubilee year comes as an Israelite, you're going to find much of the same. Some better, some things a little worse, but it won't be better until the year Jubilee. And Yahshua said that, that, that you're going to see things that are going to cause fear. The frightful things. Nuclear annihilation is very fearful for me living in Chicago. And Chicago got more nuclear reactor plants around it than any other place in the world. Do you think I feel safe in case there's a shootout of nukes between America and Russia? This would be one of the first place they hit. So I'm not saying just stay put or try to do better than. I mean, everybody should have a right to try to do better. You look where they can go, whether it's here or there. But I'm here to say there's problems everywhere now. But Yahshua said there's a year of redemption coming. He says in when you, verse 28 of Luke 21, and when these things come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. Your redemption draws near. He said. He's talking about the year of Jubilee, the year of the purchase redemption from captivity. Look up, Israel, for your Jubilee redemption draws near when you see these things. Yeshua declares in Isaiah 64, 3, for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come. He said, I got a year of redemption for you. Look up and look out. Hallelujah. May Yah bless you and keep you.